So I realized as I was looking through the program that my um, talk probably had the shortest description of it. Two lines, but uh, there's lots in here. Um, so, uh, um, so uh, for those of you who don't know anything about the Community Maps Program, uh, basically uh, we at Esri Canada and also as part of uh, Esri uh, Global are building a seamless topographic face map using contributor data. Um, uh, so it's a multi-scale base map and we're using data coming in from uh, provincial governments, federal governments, municipalities, uh, some NGOs, uh, whoever has authoritative data for their area. Uh, currently in Canada, we have about 200, a little more than 200 unique contributors uh, that we're pulling data from. And this is the base map that's available on RGS Online and through all your ESRI applications. So if you open up our map or RGS Pro or you just go to RGS Online, that's the map that you see, that's the stuff that we work on. So I have a team of currently about seven people that are working on it in Toronto and um, that's the kind of thing that we do. So the uh, challenge for us, of course, is that Canada is a pretty big, big place and we have potentially up to 5,500 contributors contributing content to the map, which is a lot. Um, of course, Canada is the second largest country in the world, so it's really slow to the larger the geography, of course, the longer it takes to process stuff. And, you know, uh, we do have limited resources uh, to process disparate data sources, um, so that's a bit of a challenge. So, uh, how do we work through that? Well, first thing is to do is stop updating our raster base map. We've been updating uh, raster base maps for, we've been doing raster base maps for years because uh, that's, that's the thing that we had uh, available to us. Um, but it does take us a lot of time. So, uh, caching, uh, as one of the people talked earlier about uh, caching maps, uh, the larger geography, the longer it takes. So, of course, we're responsible for all of Canada. If we're looking to cache that down to a one to one thousand scale, it would take us months on multiple servers to do, and we just don't have the time and resources to do that. So, uh, in the last couple of years, uh, vector uh, tile technology has become available, and we are all <coughs> jumping up and down with joy because now instead of doing Canada in months, we can actually do it in the space of 24 hours all scales, so it's a great time saver for us and that means that we can do more and keep the map more up to date. So, um, just want to talk about vector-based maps for those of you who are not familiar with vector-based maps. Uh, so basically it's vector, lines, po uh, points, polygons, um, but it's in a cached format so there is no intelligence behind it. You can't click on a feature and get any uh, attributes associated with it. It's just I guess you would call it a dumb map um, that's in the background that is meant to be used as a base map. Uh, advantage of vector base maps over raster base maps is that they are configurable and customizable, and I'll show you how you can do that in a bit. Um, you can localize them, so if you're looking to use a language other than English, uh, you can set those uh, uh, parameters and localize it according to the language you want. There, it uh, allows for dynamic labeling, so you can actually rotate the map and the labels will remain horizontal. Uh, it provides you with a wide selection of map styles, a sharper image, and of course you can zoom down to very large scales, and as I said, it's much faster to build and to draw. So um, right now in ArcGIS Online, we've got our uh, standard um, base maps, um, sort of what we call our primary base maps, which are the vector base maps are similar to the uh, raster base maps in style and look. Um, so these are also available in vector. Um, and then we've got these, uh, what we like to call creative styles, which are a bit different than our standard base map looks. So you might not have seen them if you haven't been looking at the uh, vector base maps. Um, and this is just more of an artistic uh, approach to our usual uh, collection of base maps. And the nice thing is uh, you can actually uh, style the maps yourself. So there's a um, little QR code will give you to this uh, vector style editor. Um, so you can actually uh, select any of the vector styles that are currently available on ArcGIS Online 
and you can change those styles yourself. So um, open this little bring up the browser. Just give you a quick little demo here. Um, so if I want, for instance, here's all the sort of the, the map styles that we uh, have available. If I, let's say, want to start off with a dark gray uh, canvas map, I can do that. And if I'm really lazy, I can just click on this randomize button and it'll apply <laughs> all the colors uh, automatically and clearly that really grates on our cartographic sensibilities. Uh, so you can just select any of those. Um, and the nice thing is, let's say for whatever odd reason, um, I kind of like that style but I want to do some tweaks to it, I can actually select any of these features and it will give me all the parameters for those features so I can change the color for the land for instance and I can make that green maybe a little more acceptable. And so you can go into, I'm not going to go into all the details, but you can uh, break out uh, all the different layers and select features and change the colors. You can change um, uh, font styles, uh, sizes of uh, features. Basically anything that you can see here on the map, you can actually change the styles to. So, um, the nice thing is, it's all drawing from the same vector tile database, so that gets updated. You don't have to worry about updating the map. All you have to do is uh, look after the cartography, so if you've got a set style that you want, uh, a set uh, look and feel for a map that you want for your base map, um, you can just take any one of the uh, vector tile styles that are available in ArcGIS Online and start customizing that. So all you have to do is the cartography, not the mess around with the data. That's what you want to do. So uh, check it out. It's fairly easy to use. Um, I won't go into any more details just because um, I think we're probably limited with time. So that's one thing I want you to remember. Uh, vector tile style editor. You can customize your base map however you want. So uh, here's an example of a map that's been styled. Now you might think this is kind of hideous, but this is actually what we call our Toronto Raptors map style. So we've taken the official <laughs> Toronto Raptors map style and applied it to the map, and um, hopefully that makes it for good luck for tonight. <laughs> Anybody care? So if you have another team that you're fond of, you can change it to blue and white for the Maple Leafs, or I don't know what's Vancouver's color. Yeah, <laughs> blue and white. <laughs> So, but the, but the thing is, you can customize it to make it look however you want. <coughs> so, uh, that's one thing, we're not updating the raster, we're focusing on vector, and then the other thing is of course to automate, automate, automate. Uh, that saves us a lot of time, and this is the other thing I wanted to remember. Uh, so currently, uh, we used to be doing the raster map, we're not doing a raster map anymore, so currently this is a process for one of the two vector-based maps that we're doing. Uh, so basically we have this thing called the GFX, which is, called, is the Geo Foundation Exchange. It's a hub and repository of data that sits with, uh, um, I don't think it's actually in our office, I think it's off-site, in Canada, uh, where um, basically we have all the data that we're using for the community map, so all those contributor data submissions that we have, so federal, provincial, municipal data, non-governmental organizations is all sitting in our Geo Foundation Exchange, but it's more than just a data repository. It actually goes out and checks for updates to the data. So um, it will. Uh, we've got a whole list of open data sites that Ted talked about. Some of those open data sites, a lot of those we're hitting. Uh, there's also a number of organizations that don't have open data sites that have provided data through a data sharing agreement with us that um, we access as well. So every night, the Geo Foundation Exchange goes out and checks all those data sources that we're using, which is over 200, and sees if there are any changes or updates. If there are, it downloads those changes and keeps them in the GFX itself. So when the community maps team is ready to do some uh, work on a particular community, it can pull that community's data out, do some editing and processing. Uh, so in this case, we will uh, standardize uh, classifications, for instance, of roads, for instance. Um, so neighboring municipalities might have a different interpretation of how a road class is classed. Uh, we will take a look at that and try to standardize that across the country. We 
because we are building, trying to build a seamless map for the entire country. Once we've done that, we put that into the Esri World Database, which is actually a collection of a number of databases that cover the entire world. And every three weeks, uh, the folks in Esri uh, generate a <coughs> vector tile cache for the entire world. So the whole uh, workflow uh, generally takes about four to eight weeks from the time that we get the data to the time that it's actually published on ArcGIS Online, depending on when we hit that cycle of when it gets um, updated and refreshed. <coughs> So uh, four to eight weeks is, is much improved over what our raster uh, update process was like and we had a lot of feedback from our contributors saying that was far too slow. So I think we've actually improved that, but now we've actually gone a step further, which we're very happy with, and we're actually updating the map every night. Uh, so again, uh, this is an entirely automated process. Uh, so again, the GFX will go out and check all our uh, data sources, see if there's any changes. And if there are changes, we'll download those changes. Every night we take a cut of that data and we generate a vector <coughs> cache for the country every night. So it's just Canada that we're focused on here. We don't do any edits to the data. We don't do any uh, standardizing or matching of uh, data features on orders, for instance. So if you take a close look and you know where to look, you'll find some issues with the data where things might not match up. But the feedback that we got from a lot of our contributors and a lot of our contributors are municipalities, they want an up-to-date map. Uh, so they might do an update. Um, and uh, this way, they'll see their update on the map within two days as opposed to two months or longer. Uh, so if a, a community like uh, Prince George, for instance, uh, updates our open data site uh, on a Monday night, it should be up available on our map by Wednesday morning. So we think this is like awesome stuff. So this is the other thing that I want you guys to remember. Um, so again, uh, data to the community maps program is submitted through a number of uh, ways. So if communities have an open data site, they don't have to do anything. There's no additional work for them as long as they keep their content on the open data site up to date. Then that's great. All that content's going to be up on the map. We check that automatically. Um, the other uh, uh, way of uh, data contributions is if, they're, uh, if they don't have an open data site um, and they have a data sharing agreement with them, we have an arrangement where they can package their map data up and put that on RTS Online. We can access that through a private group and we update the content that way. And the third way, which we've only done with two communities, the Township of Langley and the City of Toronto, is where we access their data base directly. So they've given us a connection to their database, and we basically go in there every night and check to see if there are any changes, pull any changes that there are, into the map. Uh, again, data stored in the GFX, which you talked about, and I actually talked about that, so it checks the data automatically. Um, so this here, great, it's working. Um, this here is a little animated map uh, for the first uh, four months or so of this year where we've gotten updates from various communities. So all across the country you can see uh, provincial, municipal, and federal governments. Um, so we've had over 1,600 automated updates from uh, over 100 communities since January 1st. We're working on hooking up to another 100 at least. Um, so any of those updates can be, you know, any little change to um, a road feature, for instance. So if a community changes the name of a road, we'll pick that up. That could be just one single change. Uh, that's kind of as an update. There could be a whole um, a wholesale change to a data layer where they're replacing um, updated buildings, for instance. That counts as another update. So a variety of updates. So we've got communities that are updating their content uh, four or five times a week. We've got communities that are updating maybe once every six months. So it's a wide range of uh, frequency of updates as well. So again, the community map of Canada Vector Base Map is basically created automatically um, and it's very much up to date. Uh, we've got standardized cartography, so it does look like our uh, raster topographic base map, um, but it is a vector base map. And again, uh, anybody who uh, is a contributor who updates their content We'll see their content update on the map within 24 to 48 hours. So here is a link to the Community Map of Canada Vector Base Map. 
um, and you can also do a search for it on ArcGIS Online. And so basically we've got two uh, vector-based maps, so if you're looking for a nice polished cartographic product, uh, go with the uh, standard Esri World vector-based map, uh, so that should look seamless and clean and tidy. The other one, maybe a little bit more frayed at the edges, but it's certainly more up-to-date than anything. I think that's out there um, and it's updated daily. Both of these maps uh, you can stylize, so you can stylize the Community Map of Canada vector-based map as well, just like you can the standard Esri vector-based map. So again, you can have a look however you want to. So uh, that's it. Uh, follow us on Twitter if you want, Community Maps CA. Uh, any questions from anyone? Slide to the second QR code. I uh, I missed that. That'd be great. Thanks. <coughs> you just want to take a shot of the code? Yeah, that's that's perfect. Any other <laughs> question? So uh, at the edge of Canada, does it just stop? Is that for the community? Well, right, right now, the way it's set up, um, actually, I probably should just open it up so you can take a look at it. Um, it, it basically stops, but uh, what we're doing is, um, with, the, with the map style uh, editor, we basically uh, styled uh, the world topographic base map such that we can put our map on top and there it doesn't look like there's overlap and stuff. So that's going to be available soon, um, so it'll, it'll look in context with the whole world. Oh, the other thing I should mention is also there's going to be a big update on ArcGIS Align uh, at the end of June, where the right now the default base map is set to a raster. Um, that's going to change at the end of June, where the default base map is going to be a vector base map. So just expect to see that happen. Um, Alton in the room. Is there any reason that you chose not to use OSM? Uh, or to like to create a competing product? Uh, yes, there's actually multiple reasons. First of all, uh, OSM, contrary to popular belief, isn't really open. It, uh, the data in OSM belongs to OpenStreetMap, so any data that we actually mix with OpenStreetMap, so if we get a contribution from the city of Prince George, for instance, it falls under the rules of the OpenStreetMap uh, uh, data policy. Uh, so that's not something that we want to do. Um, and the idea is uh, with OpenStreetMap, um, of course, as you know, anybody can contribute it, to it. Um, so you know, in some cases, in some areas of the map, there might be some issues as to what is right. I mean, anybody can go in and make mistakes, and mistakes do happen. And what we <coughs> want to do in Ezra Canada is rely on what we call authoritative sources. So, for instance, the city of Prince George has a vested interest in having the content for Prince George to be as correct as possible. So we're relying on them to provide us with correct data, and we're taking that data and including it in the map. So the idea is that the map is a, is a patchwork of quilt uh, of sorts of best available data anywhere. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other? Is there a process to become a contributor? Yes, there is. Um, <coughs> I'll talk to me afterwards. I'd be more than happy to share that information with you. Um, yeah, that's probably the easiest way to do it right now. I have a question. How many other countries in the world or international bodies have similar programs like the Community Map of Canada? Um, well, first of all, the uh, Community Map of Canada is part of the world vector, world base map, right? So, I mean, the whole world is covered by the base map, but uh, the United States has something similar because they have a similar um, structure as us in terms of uh, uh, political entities, like so, you know, states or municipalities and so on. Um, other countries, like the Netherlands, for instance, they have um, detailed uh, cadastral maps from the Dutch Cadastral Organization. Because it's a small country, relatively speaking, it, they just provide their whole data and 
ship it off all at once. We're probably one of the few, just us in the United States, is probably the only ones that are actually taking little bits and pieces and <coughs> stitching it all together. And as you can imagine, it takes a lot of work. All right, thanks a lot, Paul.